Welcome to today's episode of CLCI Live, brought to you by the award-winning and ICF-accredited school, Certified Life Coach Institute. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Hi. Hello. 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 All right. I'll get started with the the, uh, ceremonial. Please (laughs) comment. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for tuning in. If this is you tuning in, before we get started with this video, just want to take a moment to remind you, Danger Does Too, um, to please not only like, comment, and share, but subscribe. But also, if you're watching and you have questions, comments, want to join in, we do these live so that we can hear from you. And we will also answer your questions if you have them when we're not live. So please join in the conversation uh, as we, we do this. And I think that's all for me, folks, for now. Good. Uh, you know, we're missing people because they're sick, but we also gained a person to our live. <laughs> if you would like to introduce ourselves, we have an alumni with us this week. Yes. Hi, I'm Rachel Wildman, uh, completed level one, and uh, I'm a career and transition coach. So I help people through big changes in their life, including finding the career that they love. Beautiful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. So what's the topic we have tonight that we're going to have Rachel be a participant with? We're talking about how to worry better. Oh! oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's is that the title of this live stream. No. We have to stop worrying. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. or use it to our advantage versus that's our disadvantage. it. There, that's what I'm talking about. And ruined it. That's fine. I ruined it. Did I give the punchline? No, I, I ruined it. it. We can also say how to stress better, how to best your stress, how to, how to, I, I'm not, we're not saying get rid of, we're not saying to kick out the door. We're saying how do we take this emotion and make it work for us? Right. Is really what we're doing here. Um, let's talk about that. Let's talk a little about this. What is worry? Like when you, we say worry, what, what is worry? The the first thing that comes to mind is like worrying, like, uh, like your, the hem of your shirt or something like you're just picking at something and it's not really beneficial to you to do that. It's just like a release of stress inside or a release of anxiety it's how you manifest that inner emotion is by worrying. Um, And sometimes it doesn't work for you. Hmm. Hmm. you? Also um, a bit of a manifestation of a fight or flight syndrome. So kind of that inherent need to control your surroundings when you feel like something isn't right or inside you, you feel like it's not, comfortable um so that's kind of one way that you can that you counteract fight or flight syndrome is for to worry about it and think about it and look for risk mitigation strategies i guess there (laughs) that's a really really good point that you brought up because i think that when we say fight or flight we're talking about fear and we're talking about a reaction we're talking about an action i think Mm -hmm. at that point we are not talking about worry but what we're talking about is exactly what you just said is all of that thinking and catastrophizing and right. all of these things where we transport ourselves into the future and decide mm-hmm. we are psychic and we know what's going to happen. And then we start to uh, perseverate on it and um, just, you know, run through our heads every possible outcome. And then, uh, and often it can um, produce a tremendous amount of, of I think, uh, unnecessary stress for us mm-hmm. um, well it can be un- are, yeah. it can be unproductive that worry is the overthinking on steroids right on that overthinking there's there's times to consider what the possibilities are but it's when we take it to the next level and have it become what what Anthony was kind of uh, disca- describing uh, along with Rachel is the anxiety that built is built in with the worry that mm-hmm. takes it to that next level where it really becomes unproductive and not supportive of 
Oh, us as humans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Does that mean so you made that noise? That was danger, oh. um, messing with oh. my speaker cord. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, oh. danger. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel brings up a good point, too, with mitigating um, mm -hmm. you know, this this feeling that we're speaking about. I think mm -hmm. uh, to kind of just specify, uh, when I think of stress, I think of anxiety, and I don't think that's something that we can completely get rid of, um, but mitigating it is something I think it's important. Um, some handle it, you know, different ways than others, and I think that's really the whole topic that we're kind of conversing here today. You know, what was interesting in the research, um, we have these things that we've now created in our society uh, called trigger warnings. Mm -hmm. And they actually did studies where they issued trigger warnings to um, a group of people and uh, before a situation that they knew was going to be, gonna, they were going to produce a, a stressful situation and they get, issued the trigger warning and all these people had the same trauma. And then they did it to a group where they did not issue the trigger warnings and they, found, they um, then just induced the, or talked about what could cause trauma with them. And the groups that were given trigger warnings experienced exponentially higher rates of anxiety, <laughs> and um, and they they so much more were they incapable of handling the following conversation than the ones who were given no warning and were just sort of thrown into it. Um, mm -hmm. What does that say to you guys? I'm curious. Overthinking major. <laughs> <laughs> I think just go ahead, Rachel. I think it's frame. That's how you're framing the conversation to come, right? Is you're is you're saying warning? It's going to be scary. Um, be careful, and then that heightens people's stress and worry. I think not. Right? Not only does it say warning, this is going to be stressful, but warning, this is going to be stressful, and you may not be able to handle it. You might right. have some negative emotions, and we know that negative emotions are going to affect you negatively. And that's right. not good or healthy or great for you. And that's sort of what we're saying. And so then what, oh God, I'm going in, I've got to go through something I don't want to go through. Um, right. and, and I shouldn't have to go through and it creates all this stress and anxiety. Um, I have a really recent experience. Monday I had jury duty and I'd never done jury duty, but this was a criminal case that they were choosing jurors from. And what you just described Brooke, is kind of what they did. They gave you trigger warnings. And everybody had triggers. <laughs> everybody, and I'm using that everybody loosely. There was a huge proportion of the individuals there. Now, I didn't actually count them. I would say 100 people, maybe 70 people were there. And people left and right were dropping like flies because of the different triggers that were going on in the experience of becoming whether or not the a lawyer was going to accept you as a juror. It was an eye-opening experience. I'm like, no wonder lawyers have it. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting because that was an example of the lawyer probably using worrying um, and anxiety and stress to filter out and mm. find what they wanted to work for them. Yeah, now, which is messed up. Can we talk? That is emotional manipulation, right? <laughs> yeah, but here, here's where I was going to, here's the. He didn't the, warn you beforehand, you will be emotionally manipulated. So. <laughs> here's, the, here's, the, here's the jump I'm going to make to coaching now and maybe just marketing in general. You got to filter your clients somehow. So <laughs> maybe inducing some stress in them. You know, if you're trying to look for a specific kind of person to work with, do a little stress maybe filter out your oh my goodness you are such the <laughs> so now you can kind of see what job i do at clc there is some interesting things, right. so, like <laughs> well, when you bring that up that does bring make me think about some things that like um i could imagine i know us as coaches in many ways what we will do is talk things through with people right we will give a space for them to process the worry right mm -hmm. right um and my first uh, red flag goes up. Well, is this actually dangerous for us to do? Because now we're create, you know, uh, or I mean, I, I know what the big or is, but I mean, I my first, my first, that's where I first go with it is that, oh no, if I'm worrying, 
been stressing and and i'm now I'm, now i've got a client who's coming in it was, or that they're wearing and stressing and they're coming in and they're sharing all of these but what we teach is that's that's the rabbit hole right that is that that is that don't let your clients go down that rabbit hole and that's actually very good to have a coach there because the coach can hopefully keep you from getting lost in that um just spiral right right mm -hmm. right well it it might be good to set the expectations even before coaching someone what if you're in that space of like maybe you're dealing with somebody who is working through anxiety or worries about the future i'm sure rachel um you're a career mm -hmm. and transition coach a lot of people come to you worried about their future right is it your job as a coach though to alleviate the worry for them mm -hmm. How yes. So? Well, How do, you um, do that though. Well, I mean, I think um, you know when I'm coaching, I'm I'm trying to focus on things that they actually can control, so that any kind of action items that they can do. So try, trying to bring them back, you know, stop them from ruminating. And I think I feel like what sometimes when people start worrying, then they add on. So they'll go on tangents and they'll add on different things and they'll worry about this and this and this and this and this, and I'll try and bring them back to, okay, where do we want to focus today? Mm -hmm. You know, what can we focus on today that will help you kind of move forward? So really trying to stop them from that ruminating spiral that they're going down. Mm -hmm. Is it your job though? And I, when I say your job, not like the job mm -hmm. of, coach everybody to, um, you know, answer to, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say, I can't think of one right now, uh, to coddle <laughs> your client, to soothe them, to assuage their fears for them. No, no. What we're wanting to do is help them find their own self-soothing behaviors. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. we can help them find that, but you know, that mm -hmm. imagination, the prefrontal cortex, we have a really uh, amazing ability to help us uh, progress, mm -hmm. but we also have that equal ability to help us not progress. What's that word? I don't know. Not coming up. Digress. <laughs> Digress. <laughs> you know, by imagining the worst things that could happen. <clears throat> but that's also not a terrible thing either. If you have someone like Rachel, to bounce ideas off of, it becomes then what, it, you know, what kinds of things can I put into play if this scenario should happen? Well, that scenario is probably not going to happen. So I don't really need to go down that. I, I, I was going down the slippery slope and I realized that just was building on. But here's the next thing that came up, right? So we're able to have a dialogue and I'm able to communicate with my coach, Rachel, on the ideas that I have to help me overcome those triggering possibilities moments. The other, as we, you know, we were talking through this, uh, one of the things but reminded me of a quote, my favorite quote by Albert, I think it's one of my favorite quotes was by Albert Einstein is, uh, worry is a waste of your imagination. Um, and I uh, absolutely love that quote. One of the things, though, that that was addressed in the research that we did that um, was was really neat, I think, or it was a neat way of looking at it. Yeah, and I guess again, it was another study where they took children um, who suffered from anxious behavior, and they put half of them in a group of of um, the best. I, you know, psychotherapy they could get regarding with regard to anxiety. And then the other half, they told them specifically cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy. Is yeah. Cognitive behavioral therapy. And then the other half, they told them, okay, well, what you're not going to do is you're not going to try to assuage the anxiety. You're not going to try to essentially, I don't, can't remember the exact word, but like coddle or encourage the anxiety or soothe the anxiety. What you're going to do instead is if your child is afraid to sleep in their own bedroom, and they want to sleep in your bed, you're not going to let them sleep in your bed. What you're going to do is work on the steps to get the, the child sleeping in their own bed and, and working them towards that. You're not going to do this, you know, what every mom wants to do is, is make everything better. Instead, you're going to work on, take steps and work on tools to, to get them to start to face their anxiety and work in it and work with it. 
and they found that the the um the results were equal um equitable like they were the same so you had the same amount of uh progress from the ones getting the you know amazing best of the line cognitive behavioral therapy and then the, from the other group that was just sort of forced to sort of work through and and work on their anxiety and i think that that for me is very powerful especially being somebody who had ptsd um and i learned very quickly that just taking steps towards doing things and progressing and building the self-esteem yeah. that came with that i mean that came with taking these steps um of, of facing my fears of getting you know that each time i did and i got through it my my personal um what confidence grew and and having that much more self-confidence reduced that much more anxiety for me and then it just kept going you know and that was so powerful for me it was really that moment when i was like i understand how coaching can be a very powerful and effective progress pro process uh for people um that are i mean experiencing anxiety or afraid to move forward or afraid well i get it now like if i'm moving forward and i'm doing well that confidence that, that comes with that for me is the best therapy in the world <laughs> like at least it was for me i'm not saying it's a substitute but for me it was very right. powerful so um, my question is then what do we do with clients um were there whatever their assurance is or however they soothe themselves of anxiety is a block for them. It's preventing them from making progress. And it's not this external thing where I'm anxious and I'm looking towards my partner or my coach to reassure me. It's just that whenever anxiety comes up outside the coaching session, I always choose to avoid it rather than face it and move forward with my goals. How do you deal with a client like that? how to introduce, I mean, I can give you the answer that we, you and I both know, cause we did our research. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm being a bit um, obtuse here with my question, but I'm, you know. But again, even if I give you that answer, it's not the answer because the answer is we can't just give our clients that answer. We can't just say to our clients, look at your anxiety, like a friend, look at your anxiety, like a tool. So that when you experience, instead of being scared of it, instead of running from it or fleeing or fighting it, or hiding from it, you know, it's flee, fight, fawn, or there's four, there's actually four where a freeze. Um, instead of doing those four things, uh, mm -hmm. look at it like, oh, I see you, you're here. Mm -hmm. You're trying to serve a purpose for me. What is this purpose? What are you communicating? And so it's of being afraid of our anxiety, but it, embracing it. But how well, you can't say that? I can't tell my clients to do that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't tell them you can't tell them to do that but you can certainly right. go how can you utilize this as a strength versus a weakness right i think there's power go ahead rachel um, i think there's power in just the awareness as well i think a lot of people don't realize how they're self-soothing or are you know what tactics they're using. So just kind of trying to draw that out as well. So they're aware of when they're doing it um, so that they know, you know, okay, I can stop, try and stop it. I think that's pretty powerful too. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well oh, then I you had something that you were going to say earlier. Yeah. I was just going to say, there's probably, I would say there's an opportunity um, that may arise mm -hmm. in your coaching session, coaching session where you can um, ask your client, uh, about something that they may be anxious about or stressing about um, to kind of role play and imagine what on the other side of that scenario, do, had they taken certain steps, um, what would come out of that? So pretty much them kind of imagining um, whether or not essentially it's worth, worth them stressing about. So they have um, all of the end results laid out in front of them. And then once that's kind of, you know, presented to them, they can eventually say to themselves, what, what's the point of me stressing when this, this, and this are like the only outcomes that could potentially happen. And to me, those don't seem as scary as I thought that they initially would be when you can speak them out loud. I, that can help, I would say. Mm -hmm. so sometimes I'll ask, depending on what we're talking about, how has this helped you uh, having those thoughts and having that? And they go, oh, it doesn't. But then I challenge <laughs> that, that space of, well, there has to be somewhere along the line that it's it's helped you because it's you're still using it when right. if you think back and i know this is a tap back this is not a live back 
if you think back to you, through your life, when has it helped you? And then they always come up with something. And so then we bring it forward. How today can that be supportive? You know, be, again, it's turning that what they're feeling is a weakness or a limiting belief or a stop empowering it in in a space of a place that they are recognizing that they have the mobility to make those changes whatever that is i just grab them i slap them around a little and i tell them to <laughs> toughen up <laughs> that might work for some clients and not for others that's, uh, that's the filtering i was talking about earlier right um so I, i've got a question then of thinking about it'd be really easy for us coaches for our clients just to tell us hey i'm worried about this thing let's talk about it mm -hmm. or i'm anxious about this let's talk about it that'd make our job so much easier if they were just upfront about it but a lot of the times worry anxiety stress um are not verbalized so how can you as a coach tell that your client is stressed or worried or anxious what are some of the cues that a coach should look out for well before we even get there can we talk about why it is that but like it may not think our clients may not just come in and be like forthright with that like well i'm scared well i'm you know anxious well i'm um, why, why in the first place are they not sharing that with us because they're scared of what you think as a coach they don't want to be judged that becomes one reason why that's the first one i thought you know, I, I, I'm thinking of the times that I've been jumbled. You know, I have so many thoughts and so many that I, the unpacking needs to happen before I can even put a label on it. I may not know what I'm exactly feeling. I Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, Lisa, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I was going to say. I already segue to you. Go for it. <laughs> I know. I know for me, I, I have, there's been times I've experienced shame. Like I've been like, yeah. man, I'm, I should have it all figured out. I shouldn't be scared. I shouldn't be, especially when it comes to having like, I had shame. I was, I had shame around being anxious. Yeah. I had shame around being afraid because here I am a grown woman and I shouldn't be scared to leave my house. I shouldn't be scared to go do things. I shouldn't be scared to take the steps. I should have the shooting myself right should have the tools i need i should know how to do this i should know but um and so that becomes there's that's ego it's a tremendous amount of me being afraid to be vulnerable because yeah. and be honest and and one of the reasons i think that i anthony your your question is fantastic and I, we should go back to it but one of the reasons i bring this up is is to know how to know how hard it can be for for people to open up about things sometimes yes yeah and to to know as a coach that one not to, to take it personally if your client is isn't ready to to share those things I take uh, it very personally. <laughs> um, but also to know that when they do not only is that a tremendously powerful place to be in and there's a tremendous exchange of trust and that's a win in itself right that is a huge thing um for sometimes for people just to get it out and just to talk about it and to just know that that um if when your clients share those things with you that is uh i mean that's a gift that really is um, right it's a very cool magical thing that can happen in a coaching space that may not otherwise happen in any other space mm -hmm. So then it might take some time then for the coach to be able to identify, you know, sources of anxiety from their client. It might not be apparent ever in the first few seconds until you get to know them. Um, Brooke, if I could call you out. Yep, go for it. <laughs> on, on observable behavior on, you know, being aware of the patterns um, in your client. Brooke, I'm aware of being around you for X amount of years is that when you get Strikes, stressed or anxious, you tend to talk at a million miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, rate, the rate of words coming out of your mouth dramatically increases the more anxious 
true. I get that from my dad too. All this ADHD, but um, also, it's what that is. I I tend to babble when I am in a new space around new people around. In it, I you know, um, true. So very true. <laughs> um, I'm quieter when I calm down and I'm comfortable. Like that's you know, I'm comfortable when I'm quiet. So then, I guess for our viewers, then how would you as a coach bring up that observation and maybe inquire further about the behavior you're seeing in terms of Brooke? You, talking may, you, you may or may not bring it up. It depends in the moment on how it's going to best serve the client. So if I have been, I had, I was called out on it before. I have, I've had a coach. It was Dan. Dan full blown called me out on it. <laughs> how did he bring it up then he said to me i notice i can i share an observation i'm noticing that you are talking really fast and you seem like it's all up here i feel like you're you're running through everything up here you're in your head you're not um and it just feels like you're racing pretty much is what he said and so then he, by doing that i was like i am and it forced me to sort of take breath Mm -hmm. um and take a moment and sort of bring it down and like tap into what i really wanted to talk about what i really wanted to work on what really mattered mm -hmm. um and it, it was a cool moment where he sort of it was a great moment where he sort of checked my energy um and just checked in with me and allowed me to sort of where to guide it and where to take it from there and how to handle it and then also he brought an awareness around it that I carried with me in other situations where I was able to sort of go, Oh, look at me right now. This is, this is what I'm like when I'm in my head. This is what I'm like when I am nervous, when I'm anxious, when I'm spinning my wheels. Um, and it, that, that awareness is something that I carried with me absolutely just him by him saying that it wasn't just in the coaching session that it mattered. It's something that I actually wrote down afterwards on, on a, like, uh, a chalkboard sort of type thing. It wasn't a chalkboard. It was a what are the a plex? Well, not plexi. They're made out of plexi. You know, like a whiteboard. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wrote it on a whiteboard as a reminder. Mm -hmm. Like notice when you're racing. Notice these things. Mm -hmm. Don't get, pause. Take a deep breath and think through. And it it became a just from that bringing it up with me became sort of a life life lesson for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so powerful mm -hmm. moment in coaching that wasn't even around what we were coaching on. <laughs> For me. Yeah. There you go. Rachel, how do you notice, I guess, the symptoms of anxiety in a coaching session? Yeah, I mean, I've seen when I'm when I'm on video with people, I, I do see a lot of tells, like a lot of like, you know, kind of touching like, with things. Yeah, nervous like that. Um, and I've heard I hear um a lot of deep sighs sometimes, like uh, uh, or like, or they say, I don't know, um, a lot. Um, and so I'll try, just try and dig into that a little bit. Like, oh, that was a big sigh. What was behind that sigh? You know, um, or, you know, I, I feel like we're struggling a little bit here. What else could we do? Or what else could we dig into? And just try and spread it out a little bit, spread out the stress a little bit. And again, like I go back to awareness is really, I think is really important. So like Brooke said, she you now she's aware of, you know, when she, you know, is talking really quickly that that's a tell for her that she's anxious, right? And so when I, when I make people or help people become aware of their, um, their tells, then they can self-regulate and, um, and so this is kind of what I'm, I'm seeing a lot in the readings in the, the podcast videos that we're watching around the subject is that anxiety and stress is a diagnostic tool. Mm -hmm. It's essentially the same as if, you know, you see the check engine light pop up on your car. Right. You don't put a piece of post-it note over it and try to look away from it and avoid it. Now, I've done that before with my car before and has lead to very bad results. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I don't do that anymore. And when I see the diagnostic pop up, I know what it means. And it means I got to investigate further and I got to figure out mm -hmm. what the problem and solution is to this. Brooke? That being said, you know, if we're taking that analogy, I had a car, a 2000 car, actually Lisa Bryan is the car that Brian gave to me when I was like 
in between cars to drive. And he had two little zombie stickers that were <laughs> on the, they became like this, they were on the thing. And I didn't know what they were there for, but one day I moved them and <laughs> because the check engine and the check oil light were on like all the time in the car. And he just hit it with his little zombie stickers. It worked, uh, to, get okay. me, it worked <laughs> to get me through smog, which was awesome. <laughs> oh, funny. Um, so, but the car ran fine. It worked. I mean, it's still running to this day, I, I imagine. And uh, Brooke, you're I'm, ruining my analogy. I know I am, but it's not. It's not. It's going to take it one step further. Okay. Just remember as a coach, there might be times when we see that check engine light on and we we um might bring it up and the client might brush it away the client might go no you're wrong the client might go no that's not the client might be okay you know i don't that, we're not going there and you might get that strong pushback um and that's them just putting a zombie sticker over it right <laughs> um, because they're not ready to go there and we we just got to be okay or we can put the zombie sticker over it <laughs> so that we can continue and and stay in the co that client's space and then in that you know if that's where there are moments when we can give them that little bit of tough love right but uh or push back but um if they're really truly not ready to go there as lisa would say don't poke the bear and so that that we might see blinking check engine lights but it might not be um the time the right time for us to to say hey you know your check engine lights on <laughs> well and the other thing well, that we're not doing as well as diagnosing you know while we use the word diagnostic just to relate to the car more specifically just be aware we're not telling the client either <clears throat> we noticed that there was a light on can you share with me about the light <laughs> you know and so well, yeah continue if that i mean if we would send them with the analogy we'd send them to a mechanic we'd take the car to a mechanic right we wouldn't fix i wouldn't fix the car i would take the car to a mechanic because it's a sort of same situation where we're not diagnosing we're bringing it up and then if it is something that needs a, a therapist or a mechanic <laughs> they would take we're, it. we're starting to extend the metaphor a little bit further, <laughs> further <laughs> Uh, metaphors, tools uh, often used in coaching as well. <laughs> Sometimes they're more harmful than they are useful. <laughs> so, um, so that is, uh, again, one of those things. And so that's an interesting thing when we say that. When we say we don't want to, uh, we have a client that is not ready to go there. I guess at, for me as a coach, I think it's, I will make the observation and if they're not ready, I will be okay with it as long as I've made the observation, right? But I probably would still ask about the light and then let them decide what they right. want to do with it. Yeah. Well, they're, they're still going to think about that light though. At some point when they're ready, because you provided that safe space to let them process as they needed to process, they'll bring it back up again they could even bring it back up again in the same session, let alone sessions down the road. You just never know, you know, what it's going to lead. I'm thinking of someone that I coached here where that's what happened in the beginning of that session. No, 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 no. <laughs> and then by the time we were at the end of the session, he had shared everything that he said, no, 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 no about. So providing that safe space for their, integration of wh who they are and what they want to be opens that door automatically. Yeah. Um, I have an example as well, thinking back to um, client, it was like one of maybe the first one or two clients I had working here. She wanted to transition her business from um, I can't remember if it was like a, it was some sort of uh, hairdresser salon nails it's in that sort of area and it was a business she had was making her a lot of money she wanted to go transition into coaching and part of the, her anxiety was what would her family think and do about that and that was a cause of anxiety and one of the questions i asked was is this preventing you from the goals that you've set for in this session what you want to do and she thought about it she's like 
no, no, I, I'll still do what I set out to do, um, you know, in between this session and the next session that says, okay, do you want to talk about that or do you want to talk about the goals? So there's an offering of a choice there. And she says, no, not right now. I want to discuss, you know, this instead. Okay, that's fine. All you need to do as a coach, if you address it, is give the option of, do you want to talk about this or that? Where do you want to take this conversation now that this has been brought to your attention and let the client lead the way. Um, you know, that's really the response, all the responsibility I think of a coach in that sort of scenario when anxiety, a block of fear, a worry comes up, just right. give an option or a choice. I would yeah. say it might be a good idea to notate that specific worry. Um, just yeah, maybe don't, don't write it down. Don't write it down and be like, "We'll oh. talk about this next time." Notate whether or not being <laughs> up, I think, is important um, mm. because maybe eventually this can be another option that you present to them. Is you know, I see this it keeps coming up. You mentioned you didn't want to speak about it then, but it seems to keep coming up. I just want to ask: Are you sure this is something that you don't want to dig a little bit deeper into? Yeah, n um, notes or making note, mental note of. Um, habits that keep forming or, uh, you know, repetitive things that keep themes that keep coming up in the coaching sessions. Um, it might be good to maybe push, no, not push, but inquire heavily into those things. Um, I want to, I want to also, while we're talking in this space, I want to sort of just uh, address something or say something that, that I think that anxiety is a, it's another one of those buzz, buzzwords that's flown through our culture, right? And mm -hmm. um, I think that we can quickly go there. There might sometimes be a gut shot reaction when somebody says to you, well, I suffer from anxiety um, uh, to go, OK, wait, is that DSM-5? Is that to, but everybody suffers. We all experience anxiety. Anxiety is an emotion and it's an emotion that's built into us naturally. <laughs> Um, it is not necessarily something that needs therapy or psychology or, you know, uh, it's not it, because we all experience an emotion. I would say that that we it's completely normal for us to experience anxiety when it becomes a problem, when it becomes generalized anxiety disorder, when it becomes PTSD, when it becomes all of these things is when when your life is so affected by it that you are not, no longer able to function in a normal capacity, in a capacity that is healthy and good. And, and that's when that comes in where you need an advanced care. Um, so, so I can throw in the example of my Monday. Monday, I already mentioned I did jury duty. I had one of the, um, uh, it was the prosecutor, she was asking me questions. I got anxious really quickly. I felt my face flush. I felt the jitter in my answer. I felt, and I'm like, and I'm like observing myself going through all of this. What in the blazes is that about? She's just asking questions, you know, so the overthinking in the process of answering and feeling all of those things that didn't need anybody else, but being able to share, like I shared with Brooke, being able to share it with someone and just having a conversation around it mm -hmm. and discover for me what that meant, if anything. And it, it was just the room. It was an emotional room, interestingly enough. Uh, that And that's where it was. It's not something I need to dig deeper into. I just needed to be able to find the ability yeah. to have depth with it, but not have to go deep with it, if that makes that sense. So coaching hat totally off. Uh, in this situation, and anybody, I think anybody who is in a courtroom being questioned by lawyers <laughs> with a judge <laughs> president present and criminal presence, and you mm -hmm. being judged essentially, and you literally and not figured literally <laughs> judged, <laughs> literally judged. I think anybody on the planet would be anxious. Like, I think that that is a thousand percent. I think it's built into the structure that you, yeah. if, I think if you're not anxious, you have been in court way too often. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. 
far too much. <laughs> to bring that back to coaching, some clients might be afraid that you're going to judge them and that you're, you're, that, I mean, that would be a very easy way to stress your clients out is to actually judge them. <laughs> maybe a stake in their responses and in their decisions, um, which is what we don't do as coaches in case our audience wasn't aware so, of yeah. that. Good, good point, though. Really valid point. So me as a coach, how do I handle worry? My own worry. Oh, your own worry. Uh, my own worry about, about, about my client or my own worry about my own stuff? I mean, well, I think we could talk about both. I mean, can let's, I... Can let's, I um, Start with about your client. I mean, let's start. I bounced the question to uh, Rachel. Rachel, what were you worried about? And I'm assuming this is the case. I might be wrong, but what were you worried about starting out as a coach? Ooh, that's a, um, I was the main thing that I was worried about is that I have been kind of mentoring and consulting, and so. My concern is bringing that in and leading the client more than just coaching and asking the questions. So I think that was more, that was kind of the one thing I've, I've been stressing out about a little bit is that I do kind of tend to lead. So I'm working on it, <laughs> but I do get, I do stress about it <laughs> um, because I you know, I know I shouldn't. And I, and then I feel this pressure that I should, and then I worry about that pressure and I worry about my, my, um, clients, you know, get one outcome if I was consulting with them and get, would get a different outcome if I was coaching them. Right. So <laughs> I do stress about that, but, um, I think, okay. yeah, that's my, so you kind of brought up a really good point there. Uh, you were worrying about outcomes with your client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, tell me more about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm working on that too. <laughs> um, to not be attached to the outcomes um, and really just help them help it be their session and, and where they want to go. So um, I still you know, I have some great sessions where it's all about them. And then I have some sessions where I feel like I'm, I end up, I've ended up leading a little bit or worried about, you know, did the session. Um, so I guess it's all part of the learning process when you're just starting out. <laughs> did you have any worries before you became a coach about coaching? You know, I'm not sure that I did. I think it's I've always wanted to do, um, or not always to do, but it, I didn't put. A, I hadn't didn't have the coach. It's something I've always wanted to do. I've been in human resources for like over 15 years, and it was always the part of the job that I really wanted to do, but was never allowed to do because <laughs> you know we ended up doing COVID plans and paper work. Work and you know, business cannot being able to help the employees. So I knew it was something that I've always you know wanted to do. So I didn't really have any of these going in that this was the right path. I guess I don't want to. So when, when you're thinking about mm -hmm. about you're doing, Rachel, mm -hmm. and knowing the difference of who you are and the, what, what is the piece that stands out to you as the concern? Um, with when I, um, that I'm turning it into, you know, that the, the, the client, the client, so I know that the client will get more out of it if they come up with the answers. Um, and they come up with the action item. I have all of this HR <laughs> that I am trying not to impart. <laughs> they can come up with the answers. Um, and so it's, it's you know, I worry about the, how I'm coming across 
And am I asking the right questions? And I, am I not leading and or trying not to lead? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That might be one of the most common worries. worries we see with our students is asking the right questions. Am mm -hmm. I asking the right questions? Um, right. I really want to, so she said some amazing things that I really would like to sort of take a beat to highlight these, because I think these are very natural worries for us mm -hmm. as coaches to have. And she really, there's a lot there. And so, and we're talking about as a coach in a coaching session with a client, the, we can worry about asking the right questions. We can worry about how, if we're coaching right or wrong and all of the using our tools and if we're leading too much and if we're uh, doing all of these things, we can worry about our clients' outcomes and um, their success and failure. And um, we can worry about if they're going to progress, if they're going to do what they say they're going to do and, and or not. And if they're not doing what they're saying they're going to do, oh, no, I'm worrying. that is that my fault? Is that me that's causing this? Um, uh, we worry about whether or not our clients like us, whether or not they're going to book another session with us, whether or not they're going to keep going on with us, whether or not we're actually helping them. Um, I think, is there, I mean, I'm talking about in the actual coaching session too. I'm sure, you know, what, what do I ask next? Um, how long do I hold this silence for? Uh, did I miss something? Um, uh, there are a lot there's a lot of this that can go worry that can go on and i think that that it's important for us not only to just say that that happens to every coach but one of the reasons we do this and we start to talk about the ways that we can manage while we cannot give these tools to our clients necessarily in just a very you know why don't you look at your anxiety as a friend um we, <laughs> we, we as a school can give these uh recommendations and things at, to our our students mm -hmm. so what tools can we as uh the folks here who have done some coaching can we offer to our students who are worried and anxious and anxious in a session or just before you know in that mm -hmm. client coach space um what can they do to channel that worry or or address it or you know, do whatever they need to do with it. What do you guys, do you guys as coaches, what do you do <laughs> to help with that? <laughs> well, I mean, we, I think we've gone over this before. Maybe you guys talk about in class. It's been a while since I've been in a classroom, but you can, if you, the anxiety or worry or stress gets too much for you, you can stop a coaching session. Mm -hmm. You can hit the pause button be like, I got to go to the bathroom for five minutes. I'll be back. Go cry in the bathroom and come back. You know, you've dealt with the emotions, however you feel. Um, but you're empowered to manage, the, even though the client is leading the session, you're, you as a coach are empowered to manage the coaching session however you see fit. And if that means dealing with your stress or worry in an appropriate manner, you can do that. Um, but I'm being, I'm like going into the extreme spectrum where your emotions are interfering with the coaching session but that being said you bring up a good point and it's one of the things we say is um you know good coaches have coaches great coaches have great coaches um but also not only do great coaches have great coaches if they don't they have great support systems they have great people they yeah. can go talk to where if that comes up they can go after the session once they're out you know they can they have somebody they can process oh you know what this is coming up for me because one of the things that happens i think in sessions a lot of times is we will relate with our clients and sometimes that can be triggering for some coaches in some situations and so having having the somebody to to process this through so you don't bring it with you so you don't bring it home with you so it doesn't become your stuff mm -hmm. um is very a, a very very important point um so you can instead of crying your eyes in the bathroom you can maybe call somebody too and check in yeah. and just say hey i need a little just get this off my chest so that i can move forward real quick you know or what have you. yeah so i'm actually had any... go ahead lisa if i if i um it's usually my overthinking thoughts to slow down i didn't really often have worry in the session um, I would just jot things down in 
uh, a piece of paper because for me, once I got it out, I didn't have to think about it any longer. I don't have to think about that question that I think is perfect here, but the client is finding their space in this and it's not appropriate for me to ask here. Or if I, if I, it wasn't a worry, but it was a judgment. If I found I had a judgment, I could make little different uh, symbols to get it outside of me so that I wasn't in that judgmental position. Um, so I would use paper. For me, it's about paper and getting things out and jotting them down. And and what, one of the things I notice I'm doing while I'm doing that, I'm also taking some deep breaths. Mm-hmm. And that quickly can, you know, regulate a little bit hyper system for me. Rachel, I did interrupt you as we were trying to arm wrestle for the answer. You're yeah. next. Okay. I think it's- both spoke yeah. at the exact same time, so I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to tag on to Brooke's comment about the support system. So I've been doing the reciprocal coaching with other alumni, and I think that is a fantastic support system because we're all kind of going through the same things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll sometimes bring up the same topic to talk about with two or more of my reciprocal coaches and just see what kind of answers I'm getting. Um, so that I can learn from that and have lots of different perspectives on, you know, what I could be doing better or how I could be doing it better. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a great support system that we have here. Yeah. I think also Lisa, a great point that you brought up too. And even in the case of the reciprocal coaching is getting, it's really self-awareness, right? You, you brought up this judgment, you know, and, and we have to be aware of what is going on. In us and, and so when we even and that's the same thing with anxiety and with worry we have to be aware of that it's emotional intelligence what emotion am i experiencing why am i experiencing it okay I, i'm a coach right now i need to not it's not about me and my emotions so that's got to get put yeah. in a basket and a, you know in meditation they for at least when i learned to meditate they taught me to put like racing thoughts in baskets <laughs> and like you'll get to it later like you visualize it put it in a little basket <laughs> um and you know a tool, but that's a, a tool when you can't sleep you write it down you you know quickly so that jot it out real quick so that then you can get back to bed um uh so but the, really before you can even do that we have to have that beat of self-awareness and so it's so important so critical as a coach for us to be aware of our worry, of our emotion, of what we're feeling and and be able to go, okay, right now that's not appropriate for me to do. Like that is, you know, right now that's not about what this is about. I'm gonna put that here, boom. I acknowledge that that's there. And like even Lisa said, with the judgment, you know, I acknowledge that that's there, but I'm not gonna utilize that emotional tool within me at the moment because it's not productive. It's not what it needs to happen. And so, so critical for us to have awareness and ultimately in a lot of the research that's what was when we say how to best your stress and when we said how to deal with your anxiety it was not to squash it not to push it down not to 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 you know stuff the fear down or the anxiety down it's to uh embrace it and go okay hey this is a a part of being human and it's there for a reason and it's there to teach me something um it's also very akin to shadow work i would say to Jerome, you've been quiet for a long time, so I'm just going to put you on the spot with no question whatsoever. Okay, well, <laughs> I had some thoughts kind of running through my mind. I don't want to give everyone a chance. Um, you just kind of what can help you as a coach when when you're facing anxiety. I, I want to say to Anthony's point, stepping away and um, maybe taking five minutes. I would say 95% of the time, your client mm-hmm. is going to appreciate that more than you trying to fumble through your emotion and get through that session without you having dealt with that. So that's something that I know, Anthony, you said that's to the extreme, but if it does get to that point, it is something I think is very valuable to go ahead and utilize. Additionally, you shouldn't ever be working harder than your client. Um, So if you catch yourself kind of, you know, maybe I would say proverbially sweating, but maybe even physically sweating, you might want to slow down and realize this isn't about you. This is your client session. This is for them. Um, You should be allowing them the stage to go ahead and kind of progress the, um, the, the session that you're in. This isn't, you know, something that you should have the right answer at every turn for the right mm-hmm. question at every turn. Your client is the one that's progressing the, sle- the session. So you shouldn't be stressed too much about making it go um, for, for that matter. And if you are sweating in person, wear some deodorant. 
Um, <laughs> but good point brought up both Anthony and Jerome. And I think it can be applied to not just in the session, but take a beat before the session, before it even begins. Boom. And get yourself in the right headspace. Like get yourself because mm -hmm. if I'm racing around, stressed out, you know, yeah. uh yelling at somebody on the phone, and then I sit down to do a session. I'm going to bring all that energy in there with me, right? right. So it's so important before you start the session, uh, give yourself a little bit of time to just sort of get into the coaching seat, get in, let go of all of your stuff and be prepared to be a coach. Um, and so not only take the beat during the session if you need it, but take a beat before the session to get into coach you, coach mode. <laughs> get out of, you know, friend, I'm going to give you advice mode and get into coach mode. <laughs> I would give myself before getting started in, in the coach mode, as it were, um, at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes to transition from my home life, my out there life to the segue into uh, coaching world life. And then between sessions, it's either 15 to 30 minute in between. I used to do them back to back to back to back. Like it's exhausting. Yeah, it doesn't allow yeah. you to think too much about the client before though. That's, so that works. Like you're not, <laughs> or you're bringing it with you. Either. <laughs> your poor last client has to deal with all the previous clients. <laughs> She's been put through the ringer. <laughs> No, I was pretty good at it, but I also didn't have any, I just didn't have enough space in there to even just go to the bathroom. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> so self-care became important. That's where, yeah. yeah. That's where those tools of like that you'll get when you search, you know, how to beat anxiety, how to reduce anxiety. You're going to see a lot of tools that say sleep more, uh, eat right, you know, work out, uh, self-care and do all of these things we as adult humans probably know i mean we should know and no but, but we probably don't do but we probably yes. do. as a coach it's very important that we do that for ourselves before we mm -hmm. sit. we have to nurture ourselves so that we can be in a good spot and and they're in in the right coach mm -hmm. mode for our clients that'll be my last bit of advice when it comes to worry you guys want you guys what are your final thoughts and then we're about done <laughs> uh my final thoughts uh worry is a tool to utilize anxiety is a tool to utilize use them to your best and fullest advantage as a coach um because they can show you you know what directions to go and in the case of a client you know it's a tool for them as well and it's up to them to use it or not uh that's my final thought mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, sign on to Anthony. I don't have anything additional. That's what I was thinking. So I agree. I could have just done that for Brooke. That would have been so much easier to say, yeah, I do it, Brooke. Um, I would say kind of similar to Anthony and also just touching on to something earlier that Brooke said, she was kind of speaking on um, self-confidence. That's, I think, huge in dealing with anxiety. I would agree with what she said. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you are looking to manage your uh, stress and you don't know where to start, I think starting with your yourself, your image, your self image is a, a really good space to start. If you don't know exactly what concrete steps to take um, and you want something that's a little bit more um, concrete as far as taking steps to help get away from anxious moments or kind of mediate that, that, you know, stress that you may have um, working on your self image and your self confidence is something that can hugely help in those scenarios. Rachel. Yeah, I would, so I heard a quote once about um, if you're depressed, it means you're living in the past. And if you're anxious, it means you're living in the future. So trying to live in the present, um, I try to do that a lot and just kind of take it day by day. And um, and that seems to help decrease stress as well. So awesome. do you have uh, a social slide. media website you want to plug as well? We're going to wrap up. Uh, my website is Coach Rachel Wildman. Um, dot com. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here, Rachel. It was great to meet you and have you connect with us and share with us your wisdom in this experience. Thank you. Yes, it's been fun. Thanks, everyone. So that'll wrap up the last live of the entire year. Oh, oh yes. my goodness. We'll yes. see you in January. January. In the meantime, 
Be sure to <laughs> like, subscribe, comment, share this video, and tell all your friends about Certified Life Coaches to treat yourself to a nice Christmas gift of Coaching 101 and 102. Dangerous signing off as well. Dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> you can take some. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Once again, this is brought to you by Certified Life Coach Institute. We're an ICF accredited school who certifies our life coaches in three-day online intensive courses. In addition to other podcast episodes, feel free to check us out every Tuesday at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time on YouTube or Facebook for our CLCI Lives, where we get together and discuss various topics that are centered around sharpening your skills so you can become a better certified life coach. For more information, feel free to visit us at certifiedlifecoachinstitute.com. Until next time, be well.